Hello, and welcome to lecture six of Semantics of Programming Languages. In this lecture, we're going to uh, take our little while language and start making it look a little bit more like a real programming language. And in honor of this change, this uh, the addition of functions to our language, we're going to upgrade from L1 to L2. So in L1, we had, we had uh, um, mutable variables, locations, and we had conditionals, sequencing, and while loops, which is enough to make the language Turing complete. But the thing that we lacked was we had no ability to build abstractions. So if you wanted to uh, do something twice, you would need to write down that code twice. And so the means of abstraction in a programming language are typically something like functions. And many, many different languages have very many different versions of this. So, uh, so in standard ML, we have a keyword fun, which lets you define a function. So uh, in standard ML, it is fun add one x equals x plus one. This will create a function add one, which is the successor function. And in OCaml, you would write uh, um, let add one x equals x plus one, and it would mean the same thing. You can uh, you can implement this as a uh, as a method in uh, in a uh, uh, in a in a uh, object oriented language where you say okay I have a public int add one function and now I return x plus one um, and in in basically every language that you can think of high low, uh, both high level like JavaScript or Smalltalk or Lisp and low level languages like uh, C, C++ and Rust, you will find the ability to build abstractions. Um, even languages you've never heard of like VBScript, uh, which was Microsoft's competitor to, uh, to JavaScript back in the day, uh, possibly even before many of you were born, it supported features, it supported functions. And so all of these all of these languages have like slightly different notations for it. Um, so for instance, in VBScript here, if VBScript didn't have a return keyword to return a value you assigned to the uh, you assigned to the name of the function. And this is a, this is the convention that this is a convention it inherited from Pascal. Um, up here, um, staring at it, I'm not actually sure what language it is. If it were Java, you would need a return keyword, uh, but this one doesn't have it. So, uh, you know, maybe it's a typo, maybe it's a language I haven't heard of. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of languages and they all have some kind of functions. So in C-sharp, for instance, um, the function functions also have, uh, have many different names. And uh, in C-sharp, functions are called delegates for some reason. It's an object-oriented language, it had methods, they decided to add functions to it as well because they're just so handy, and for some reason they decided to name them delegates. And so here what you're going to see is a class, which is the main class, and it has a, uh, a, a class M and it has a method main, and what they do here is they are on line, on this line right here, they um, they create an array of functions. So this is uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a really powerful feature, which is the ability to treat functions as values. So now we have uh, now we have an array, and in those array we're going to put some functions. And C and C sharp we're going to call them delegates for some reason. And so what this is going to do is it's going to make a loop, and it's okay, we're going to say okay for we're going to initialize an integer i to zero, and then we're going to iterate up to from zero to ten, and we're going to uh, um, at each at each entry of the array at funks of i, we're going to put in a delegate which returns i, and then this is a little puzzle here. What we're going to do is we're going to say okay for each uh, function in that uh, in that uh, list of functions, we're going to call the function and then we're going to write the result to the uh, to the console. And so now what we're going to see here is one of the key design decisions when it comes to designing languages with functions. Um, and, the, and that question is, I just said, oh yes, we're going to write a delegate which returns i. And the answer question is, what will, what, what is i bound to here? Like, like, like uh, the scope of int i 
is are these curly braces right here and yet we're binding funks of i fu the the delegate refers to i we're putting it into a uh, data structure and then we're accessing that function later after i has gone out of scope and so the question and this is one of the main dis design questions in designing a uh, a language with first class functions is what does i refer to after i has gone out of scope and so one one answer is it could it could refer to whatever value i was bound to at that iteration through the loop and if it did that then you would expect it to uh, you would expect it to um, each of these functions the i function would return that value i and let's see if c sharp does that oh no c sharp c sharp won't do that and the reason it won't do that is because the, it takes the point of view that when you set up a for loop, there's one binding that's getting updated on each loop. And so all of these delegates are going to share that binding. And so they'll end up all returning uh, the, the same value, which will be 11. Um, I think we saw that in the first lecture, actually. And then this question of like what what is captured when a function outlives its uh, outlives its uh, defining scope that's like one of the key the key questions in the design of programming languages and many languages have made many different choices in this regard and one of the surprises of programming languages research is that actually there is a correct choice and the most of the wide variety of choices were actually wrong um, and so we're going to we're going to look at the the correct choice in in this class. And um, what you'll see is that languages that made uh, the ma that made the wrong choice will will often have surprising anomalies. So, for instance, in uh, in C sharp, um, this uh, this for loop behavior was the first one they implemented, and it was so confusing to programmers that the for each uh, the for each loop here has an entirely different semantics. So in the for each loop, this variable f gets bound anew on each iteration. And so if we had uh, used a for each loop for each i from uh, 0 to 11 and built an array of delegates, we would have gotten um, functions that return that return the numbers from 0 to uh, 0 to 10. And so so C sharp made a made a mistake and then corrected it, and what we're going to see is what the correct behavior is, how to how it works, how to implement it, and how to prove things about it. Okay, so to do to study to study functions and variables in more detail, what we're going to do is we're going to add expressions like like these to uh, to our L1 language and turn it into L2 thereby. So we're going to write a, we're going to have an expression fn and then a variable a type and then the body of the function. And so the the body of the function is just one expression and remember that uh, there's no uh, expression statement distinction in L1 so everything will be uh, uh, everything having just one expression is enough because you can build build sequencing expressions using the semicolon operator. And so what you can do is you can write expressions like fn x uh, goes to x plus 1. And once you have a function expression, you can apply it just by juxtaposition. So this is exactly like in OCaml. So we have a function expression, we give it an argument, and then it's going to do what you expect. It's going to substitute 7 for the formal parameter x, and then it's going to evaluate 7 plus 1, which will give you 8. And uh, function ex functions are expressions, and they can occur anywhere a f uh, uh, any other expression does. So, for instance, a function can return a function as an argument. So this is the curried function style. So we can write a function fn y colon int to fn x colon int to x plus y. And similarly, you know, we can say if you have one of these functions, fn y to fn x to x plus y, and you apply it to one argument, you're going to follow the same principle every time. We're going to substitute 1 for the formal parameter y, and we'll be left with fn x goes to x plus 1, which is exactly the same as the thing up here. And um, the, the other thing you can do is functions are expressions, 
functions are values and you can bind them to variables. And so, so far in L1, we've, we've restricted locations to only contain integers. And for variables though, we're going, to, we're going to take a much more liberal view. We're going to say that a variable can be bound to any value. So that's why these variables all have a type annotation, colon type. And we're going to give a type, uh, we're going to include a type former int arrow int, which is the type of functions that take an integer and return an integer. And so now on this line, what we've got is a, uh, a lambda abstraction which takes a function x as an argument, and then it returns a function, which takes a y as an argument, and then it returns x of x applied to y. And so, what, so we have this higher order function. So higher order function means a function which takes another function as an argument, and it's going to return a new function as, a, as its result. And so what you'll see is that uh, when you have a higher order function, you can pass it in a, a function as an argument, and then you can, it's, if it returns a function, you can give that an argument as well. So it's actually worth spending a little bit of time seeing how this works. Okay, so what, we've, what we did here was we said, okay, we can have to x plus one, and you can see it's a function which takes an integer and returns an integer. And what we can do is we can give it an argument. And that returns eight as expected. And we, now let's go and try our Now what we can do is we can say, okay, if you give me an integer, what I can do is I can uh, take x and apply it to x applied to y. So this is going to take this function x and apply it twice, once to the argument y, and then the result will also be applied to x. Okay, and so what do we get? Now you can see the type. It takes an, a function of type int arrow int, it takes another integer and it returns another integer. And if we give it a single argument, it was it's going to give us a function from integers to integers. And now if we, what did we do? If we give it a seven, let's see what happens. So what we expect is we're going to substitute uh, we're going to substitute z plus one and for x, and so we're going to call this uh, increment function twice. So we should expect a nine. Let's see if I'm right. And so I am. And so what, you can, what we can see here is that this function takes two arguments. One is a function and one is a, uh, is a, uh, a number. And you, because the type of this uh, expression is int arrow int to int to int, what we can do is we can give the arguments one at a time by partial application, like you saw in OCaml last year. Okay, so this is how we expect functions to work. Um, and it turns out that when you're doing things like proving type safety theorems, the the behavior for functions that you see you've, you saw in OCaml is the uh, is the uh, um, is the strategy that works the best. And um, Languages often, language implementations often go through this cycle of they will make up a different implementation strategy, uh, discover that they don't like it, and then go and go back to the uh, to the lambda calculus style of variable binding. Okay, and so now what happens? So how do we how do we add it to our programming language? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to extend the L1 syntax. And so I said, we're going to add functions and variables and uh, applications to our language. Well, you know, the most basic thing that we need are the variables. And we're just going to take the variables to be drawn from some countable set of names. So we'll call it X for the variable, big X for the variables. And we'll just say, okay, this has a bunch of, a bunch of names, X, Y, Z, and so on. And 
Um, if you want, if you're implementing a programming language, perhaps you might choose strings or or unique identifier in numbers as unique numbers. There's a lot of different ways that you can implement it, and as long as they're number, as long as they're no, uh, unique, as long as it's countable, that that will do the job. And then what we're going to do is we are going to add a new expression form, fn x colon t to e, and that's the expression that represents a function and once you have a function the thing that you can do with a function is you can apply it you can take a function e1 and give it an argument e2 and that function application will be the will, will be how we write uh, this juxtaposition is how we write function application and the functions bind formal parameters and so the formal parameters are variables and we can refer to variables by just writing down their name and so these three three additions to L1 will take us up all the way to L2. But we have added a new expression form for the language. And we've uh, the question now is, like, what is its type? And so before in L1, we had three primitive types, integers, booleans, and units. And now what we're going to do is we're going to extend the language of types with the, uh, with the function type t1 arrow t2. And remember that T1 and T2 are both types, and so you can substitute any other type for T1 and T2. So you could have int to int, bool to bool, int to bool, and those are all types. And so that, that's how we get the higher order uh, types as well. So since int to int is a type, that means int to int to int is a type, and int to int to int to int is also a type. So now we have like an entire, uh, an entire hierarchy, uh, infinite set of types. And however, we're not going to change what you can store in a location. For now, we're just going to leave it as uh, locations still just contain integers. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at changing that later on, but not yet. We're going to add functions to our language first, and then we'll see how we can make further extensions. Okay, so now the, the first question that we run into is, um, uh, we are allowed to write fn x, uh, x arrow e, so what happens if we do it twice? And so if you wrote fn x colon int to fn x colon int to x plus 1, what should happen? And there's, there's actually several possible choices here. And this is a case where um, there are several valid choices, and none of them are especially problematic. Um, one choice that uh, that uh, Java makes, for instance, is that uh, <coughs> if you have a variable in an outer scope, you can't redeclare it in an inner scope. So in Java, if you declare an integer variable y, then in a later scope, you can't redeclare the variable int y. And they'll say, no, you're trying to shadow this outer variable y, and that is not allowed. However, in ML, that, that is allowed. So there's nothing stopping you from doing something like uh, fn x int to fn x int to x plus 1. And so here, this is now a function that takes two integers as arguments, 1, 2, and both of these formal parameters are named x. So the question you might ask is, well, which one does this usage refer to right here? So we have an x here, and does it refer to this one or that one? And the rule chosen in uh, functional languages like OCaml and uh, SML is that the inner one you always refer to the inner uh, to the inner uh, innermost scope, uh, binder. And so that means that if we wrote uh, 7, 1 here, so we give it both formal parameters, this thing is going to return 2 rather than 8. Um, but, but Java says, well, there's a, there's a good chance of it being con uh, uh, confusing, so we're going to rule it out. And both of these choices are valid, and we'll see very shortly why both of these cho choices are valid. And the reason is that fundamentally a formal parameter is a formal parameter, like it's a, it's a placeholder for a value. So um, the the 
the uh, the variable name in some sense doesn't really matter. So what we inside in, in an expression f x colon t arrow e the x is a binder. It says um, this x any x you refer to inside of e means this uh, this x right here. And so the uh, the inside the inside the body of the expression e we're going to we're, what we mean is that anytime you see an x that isn't that isn't uh, shadowed by a, a nested uh, fn x colon something um, all of the x's that you see all mean the same thing this formal the same formal parameter of the function so if you if we write an expression like uh, fn x colon int goes to uh, x plus x, what we mean here is that whenever we pass an argument to, uh, to this function, it's going to use the same formal, the argument twice. The argument will be copied once, to he once in this occurrence and once in that occurrence. So if we write uh, fn x plus x and we give it 6, we're going to get 12. And that that 12 occurs because the 6 gets uh, gets referred to twice. And so so the the formal parameter tells you how to use the arguments given to the function. And the 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 point is that the formal parameter is uh, is just there as a placeholder. Which this is why we call it a formal parameter. It's not a real it's not a real argument. It's it's a stand-in saying when an argument is actually supplied to the function, this is where I'm going to route all the values given to this function. And so because it's just a placeholder waiting for a value, it doesn't matter what variable we used for the formal parameter. It, um, we should be able to change the formal parameter however we like and still get back the same function. So here, we I wrote fn x goes to x plus x, and if we change x to y, we should still get 12. And furthermore, we want fn x goes to x plus x and fn y goes to y plus y to be totally indistinguishable. So the expectation that we have as programmers is that if we change the variable names in our program, then the meaning of the program doesn't change. It should compute the same value. And so this is what is meant by a formal parameter. It's a stand-in for something else, and because it's just a stand-in, you should be able to change it to anything you like without changing the meaning of the program. And so you've, you've already seen this come up in mathematics classes you've, uh, you've taken before. So for instance, in integrals, you might say, okay, well, I'm going to integrate the function x plus x squared from 0 to uh, 1. And that is exactly the same as saying integrate y plus y squared from 0 to 1. And so all we've done is we've renamed x to y, and because all that's happened is a change of variable names, these two things are exactly the same as before. And it's not just in integrals and lambda calculus that you see this. You even see this in, uh, in arithmetic. So, you know, if you write a... If you write a... Uh, uh, expression like big sigma and you write oh i i is equal to 0 to 100 and you're going to add up the numbers this thing is exactly the same as adding up the uh, adding up the numbers So when you, when you add up the numbers from 0 to 100, um, it doesn't matter whether the formal parameter here is, zero, is i or j. And the reason is that this, this thing right here is a binder. Um, so we're saying, I want to take this expression, and I'm going to substitute the numbers from 0 to 100, and then I'm going to add those all up. And because we're going to substitute a specific number for this formal parameter, um, that formal parameter doesn't matter. So these two things should all be absolutely identical to each other. Um, and so this is the convention we learn for mathematics in, uh, in uh, 
primary school, secondary school, and you know all of mathematics. And so, um, f- sort of for consistency with the uh, with the rest of the scientific world, it's it's good to maintain the same notion of uh, of renameability in a programming language as well. And so, the idea behind a behind this ability to rename formal parameters is is called alpha conversion. So the idea, so you know, the, the these so in um, in programming language theory, you'll sometimes hear about people talking about things like alpha conversion and beta conversion and eta conversion and things like this. Um, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, each of these names refers to a specific concept, but the but the uh, but the but but unfortunately, like. Uh, um, the uh, the name alpha conversion came from a list that uh, that the uh, that one of the early pa- papers on lambda calculus decided to name by uh, by using Greek letters for the li- to identify the elements in the list and so they don't actually mean anything but you still you'll still hear them and so alpha conversion is precisely represents the ability to re- rename formal parameters without changing the meaning of a program. And so the idea is, you, in order to define alpha conversion, what we need to do is we need to talk about the occurrences of a, uh, of a variable. So the thing we've seen is if you have a program fn x goes to x plus x, we should be able to rena- rename it to fn y goes to y plus y. But what if I give you a program um, fn x goes to x plus z here? And so in this in this uh, in this expression, one of the x one of the variables the x is bound by a binder. And one of the other ones, the Z, is not bound by a binder. And so the ability to rename variables only applies to variables that have a, uh, that have a, uh, um, a, a, a binder. So if we were writing a, uh, a big summation, so if I wrote F of, uh, uh, let's see, how do I want to write this? So if, you, if we were trying to write a, Big a uh, big summation, and I had let's say i times j. I would expect this to be equal to. I would expect to be able to rename the i so that we're summing over. Uh, we're summing k times j should be the same as summing i times j if you just change the formal parameter. But the thing you can't change is the j. So it's not equal to k times n. And the reason is that this n is some, is a is a uh, is is a value that's not under our control um, in this in this particular expression here. So we can rename the i the formal parameter but we cannot rename we cannot rename the free variables and so the same thing happens in a programming language so in this expression right here the x is a bound variable so it occurs bound and this z is a free variable it's not it doesn't have an enclosing binder in the expression and so um, so to, for, to semi-formalize it, we can say that an expression is free if it does not occur, an occurrence of x is free if it does not occur inside the, the scope of a binder. So if you, if you have an expression 17, well, this doesn't have any free or bound variables. In the expression x plus y, both x and y are free. In the expression fn, x int goes to x plus 2, this thing has no free variables because this x is bound. And over here, when we have fn x goes to x plus z, then the x is bound and the z is free. And so the x is bound because you can look and see that it's occurring inside of an fn x. And so now, if you have an even more complicated expression, say if y, then 2 plus x, else 
fn x int goes to x plus 2 z, well, uh, the variables z and y are obviously free, but then there's question of x. Um, is x free or bound? And the answer is both. So this occurrence of x is free because there is no enclosing fn, and this occurrence of x is bound. So whether a variable occurrence is free or bound is not a property of the whole variable. It's a property of the occurrence where in the term it occurs. So x is bound right here and x is free right here. And so now that we have this uh, um, notion of what a free variable is and what a bound variable is, we can use it to spe uh, formalize alpha conversion. So the ability to rename formal parameters. And so you can see here that this is like, you know, the basic mathematical uh, trick where we have an idea that we want to formalize, which is that uh, we want to be able to rename formal parameters. But before we can get to the thing that we actually want to do, we have to formalize some more primitive concepts. And here, the, I, we, here we're, the thing we're defining is whether a, a variable occurrence is free or bound. And so the way that you can think about it is that if, whenever you see a variable, you can draw an arrow from, if you can draw an arrow from the variable to its binding site, then you know it's a bound variable. And so in this first expression, we, we, have, a, we have a target we can draw a line to, so it's obviously, it's obviously a bound variable. And in fn x goes to x plus z, we can draw a line from the occurrence to the binder for x, but there's nothing that we can draw a line to for z. And um, this kind of backwards pointer we uh, mean this kind of backwards pointing means that uh, um, the the same the same binder binder can have multiple arrows pointing to it. So if you see f n z goes to z plus z, both of these occurrences point to the same binder. And so this 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 is going this is how we how you can think about the idea that when you pass an argument to a function if you use the formal parameter twice the argument will get used twice. And so now you can see that like you know this pointer structure is exactly the same for fn x goes to x plus z and fn y goes to y plus z and so now we can start to think oh okay well perhaps this pointer structure is the thing that's characterizing whether two uh, expressions are the same up to renaming of the bound variables and so in order to uh, to uh, formalize our convention, what we're going to say is that whenever we see an expression fn x colon t to e, we are allowed at any time to replace the binding of x and all occurrences of x that are bound by that binder by any other variable. And so here you can see that this won't fundamentally change anything because this binding structure, if we rename x to z, it's going or x to y, it's going to be it's going to be the same pointer structure. So if you change the this x to a y and you change the x here, then the uh, the the pointer structure will remain the same, and so these two things are really equivalent. And if you have an expression where there are multiple binders. Uh, uh, for, for the same variable, the pointer goes only to the innermost uh, uh, enclosing, enclosing x. And so what this means is that if we change y, x to y here, this one won't change because we only change all of the occurrences that point to this x. And so, so what we have is so if we have fn x goes to fn x goes to x plus one, we think, okay, well, we should, if we rename the outer to y, this will, this will go, this will be the same as fn y goes to fn x to x plus one. And the reason for this is that 
Well, the reason we don't change this x is because its binder is, is this occurrence right here. And so this expression, these two expressions are the same because there, there are no occurrences of this uh, uh, corresponding to this outer binder. And so we could change this to z, and these, this is the same. And that's the same as change as leaving the outer binder unchanged and changing and changing just the inner one. So all of these variations are deemed to be identical, and the reason they're identical is that this pointer structure of where e of of where each occurrence is linked to its binder that doesn't change. And so the idea is that. Um, we're thinking of the syntax not as purely as abstract syntax trees, but as sort of abstract syntax trees with pointers inside of them. And so the idea is to to work to to define abstract syntax up to alpha conversion is that what we're going to do is we're going to say that we're going to start with you know the sort of the basic abstract syntax trees. So what we want to establish is how do we set up our syntax trees and understand them so that fn x goes to x plus z is the same as fn y goes to y plus z, but these two are not the same as fn z goes to z plus z. Okay, well to understand that, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the basic abstract syntax trees for these uh, for these three programs. So. For fn x goes to x plus z, we're going to say we have a function node in our syntax tree with an x in it, and it's going to con the functions contain an expression, so it's going to have a sub-abstract syntax tree, and that sub-abstract abstract syntax tree is going to be the AST for x plus z. So we have a plus and two subterms x and z, and variables are are sort of the base of the b and f, so they don't have any subtrees of their own. And so for fn y goes to y uh, plus z, we'll have a fn y arrow and then a similar syntax tree uh, plus y z. And likewise for fn z goes to z plus z, we're going to have a syntax tree where you have a plus and then two z's. And now what we can do is we can add the pointers. So from each x, we're going to add a pointer to the nearest and closing uh, binder for that variable. So for this, for this, for this x, we're going to add a pointer to the binding site, and so for this y, we'll add a pointer to the to the binding site y. And then what you can do is you can say, let's remove. So once we have the pointers. We don't actually need the variable names here. So the reason we used a variable name was to connect the occurrence to the binding site. And if we actually have a pointer in our hand, we don't need the variable anymore. And so now if we remain, remove the names of the binders and their, and their occurrences, we'll get a tree fn dot uh, int arrow. And now we have a plus and on the right, we have a z, which is the uh, free variable. But on the left, instead of an x, we just have a pointer back to the binding site. And now what you can see is that this tree and this tree are the same. So fn x arrow x plus z has the same binding tree as fn y goes to y plus z. So once we add pointers to the binding sites and erase the names of the occurrences, we're going to end up with exactly the same tree. And on the other hand, though, if for the fnz goes to z plus z, both of these locations will have occurrences will have a pointer back to the binder. And so now you can see that these three trees, two of them are the same. This one and this one look the same, but these two are different from this tree. And this is exactly the notion, this sort of formalizes exactly the notion of alpha convertibility that we want. So what we've got is, well, if you renamed this formal parameter, you could get the same as, the, you could get to this one because you could take any, uh, uh, any, any binding tree with pointers and 
put variable names back in. So if we could we could take this and say, okay, I can I want the formal parameter x, and now I'll find all of the occurrences that point back to here, and I'll put in x there, and then you get this one. And you can also take this very same tree and put a y here and replace all of its occurrences with a y. And now you'll get both of the you'll get both of these two trees again. And so now we have the syntax tree, which represents, the syntax tree with pointers represents abstract tree up to renaming, up to alpha conversion. And so for more complicated examples, so if, if let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So what we are going to say is if you have two variables, fn x int goes to fn x int to x plus two, that should be the same as fn y int goes to fn z int to z plus two, but this should not be the same as fn z goes to fn y to z plus two. And the reason is that this z points to this argument, and over here, this z points to that argument. So here we've swapped the two, uh, the names of the two formal parameters. And so we would expect the, the syntax trees with, uh, with binding to be exactly the same. And so if you, if you follow this procedure of making a syntax tree and then drawing a, pointer, uh, drawing a pointer from the occurrence to the binding site and then erasing the names, you'll find that these two expressions here, the fn x goes to fn x goes to x plus two and fn y goes to fn z to z plus two, these two will both have this tree. Whereas this one over here, where we have fnz to fny to z plus two, that is going to have its occurrence point to the first argument. And so these two trees are different, and so therefore they are not they are not alpha equivalent. So we can judge the ability. So so this sort of gives us an algorithmic way of deciding whether two terms are equivalent or not. And <clears throat> now if we add applications to this language, um, nothing, nothing too much will actually happen um, because application from the point of view of a syntax tree is just the same, is just a binary operator, exactly like things like uh, um, addition. So what we'll see, so the way we'll draw it is in our concrete syntax, we just write application by putting two expressions next to each other. And in our abstract syntax, we'll add a node in our syntax tree for, uh, for application. And what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to say, uh, we're just going to write an at sign. And you can think of this as, as A for apply. And so we're going to say, okay, for this function, uh, fn x to x, we can draw a little syntax tree for it. We have the function node and it an occurrence pointing back to the uh, pointing back to the binding site. And in here, with a more slightly more complicated expression, we have fn z goes to fn y goes to z y y. What we can do is we can say, okay, well, down after the we have the two layers of lambda abstractions, and then we're going to have a, a nested application. So, uh, so uh, application uh, associates to the left, so we get a left-leaning tree. So this will be z, y, y, and we, after we add pointers and erase the names, this z will point back to this function, uh, to this function argument, and then the both occurrences of y will point back to the second to the second argument to the function, and so the graph looks a bit complicated, um, but really the way to the way to internalize this is just to draw some syntax trees for functions, add the arrows, and then erase the names, and then you'll see how how all this uh, how all this arises. Um, so. One, one implementation technique for these pointers is something called de Brown indices. And de Brown indices have a, use an interesting representation of these pointers. So I said, when we drew these pictures, I said, oh yes, you can have a pointer from an occurrence back up to its binding site, but how do we actually implement those pointers? And so um, 
one way you can represent these pointers is by the number of, of uh, binders that you have to cross to get to the binding site. So here, if you have a function which takes two arguments and you refer here to the, uh, to the inner binder, we can just write, this is a variable and it's, it's going to refer to the zeroth binder. So we have a binder zero and a binder one. So we're computer scientists, so we're going to number these binders from, uh, from zero to zero to n minus one. If you have n binders on the path from an occurrence up to the root. And so here, what we're going to do is you can think of this as the function fn uh, x goes to fn y goes to y plus two. And if you draw the tree for that, you're going to have a binder, uh, a, v a variable occurrence that points to the inner binder. And if we have erased all the binder names, um, one way you can refer, you can identify the binder is you can say, well, there's a path from, from this occurrence back to the root of the syntax tree. And you can identify the, 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 binding, the binding site by counting the number of binders that you cross before you get to your own binder. So here, if we, uh, if we, if we are pointing to the inner, to the inner uh, argument, the second argument, um, we don't cross any binders, so we have a zero. And if we want to point to the first argument, we have to, in the syntax tree, cross the cross the second the binder for the second argument before we reach the binder for the first argument. And since we cross one one uh, binding site without using it, we can write v1. And so this representation was invented in the 1960s by a mathematician named De Brown, and it turns out to be a, uh, a quite a, quite a good representation. And it's also like uh, ends up being closely uh, closely related to how you compile uh, um, functions to machine code. So if you think of you know in C when you pass arguments, you push them onto the stack. The the De Brown index is what uh, what slot stack you have to get to. So here, if you have an argument function with two arguments and you refer to the second argument, that's going to be on the top of the stack. Whereas if you refer to the first argument, you've pushed two arguments onto the stack. So you're referring to the thing that's, uh, that's not on the top of the stack, but one below. And that's exactly what this number is. Okay. So de Brown indices are a really good implementation technique for, uh, for working with terms up to alpha equivalents, but it turns out to be very difficult for humans to read. You have to draw, you have to draw these graphs, and then once the graphs are drawn, you have to stare at them for a while. And it's still useful to be able to work with variables. Um, and another way of formal, formulating alpha conversion is to work explicitly with sets of free and bound variables and define what renaming actually does. And that's what we're going to do next. So if, you, if we have a term that actually does have variables in it, we can actually define the free variables as a recursive function. So if you have an expression x, uh, a variable occurrence x, its free variables are the singleton set of that variable. If you have, say have an operator like addition, the free variables of e1 plus e2 are going to be the free variables of e1 unioned with the free variables of e2. And if you have a, uh, a function, this x is a binder. So the way that you calculate the free variables of a, of a function expression is we can say, well, first calculate the free variables of e, and then we can remove x from it. Because if you just calculate the free variables of e, x is going to come up as free, and then since it's bound right outside, we can delete it from this set. And this will give you this, uh, this recursive computation will give you the set of free variables. And then we can define a function, an expression to be closed if it has no free variables. And we can also list, lift this notion of free variables to sets of expressions by saying, okay, if you, the free variables of a set of expressions is going to be the union of uh, the free variables of all of the individual expressions. And so an interesting thing to note is that this computation of free variables is alpha invariant. 
So if we took this function expression here and we renamed it from fn x go, uh, t to e to fn y uh, goes to e with the appropriate renaming, we'll get the same set of free variables. And um, to prove this, you would need to do a, a proof by induction on the syntax trees, and in fact, they're decorated syntax trees. And so now, if we want to talk about actual uh, uh, actual substitution with variables, um, so when we talked about functions, what we said was, okay, these formal parameters are standing for the actual arguments. And the way that we uh, the way that we um, implement, will implement this in our in our semantics is by literally substituting actual parameters for formal formal parameters, and so we're going to write uh, curly brace e slash x close curly e prime, which you read as substitute e for x in e prime for we're going to find every free occurrence of x and replace it with e inside of e prime. And so if we have an expression x is greater than or equal to x, and we substitute 3 for x into it, we're going to get 3 for 3. And if we substitute 3 for x um, in, this, uh, in this application, we're going to find all of the free, ver free occurrences of x and replace them with, uh, with 3. And so what we'll see is that here, this expression has one bound and one free occurrence of x. So we only substitute three for the free occurrence of x. And the reason for this is um, we had, we wanted to substitute three for x in fn x goes to x plus one x. Is that right? Oh, x plus y. And so, uh, the, the, what we want is we want to maintain the principle of, of alpha equivalence. And so we want this thing to be exactly the same as that. So if we renamed this formal parameter from x to z, we want these, these two expressions to be exactly the same. And for them to be exactly the same, all of the operations that we perform have to have to respect this alpha equivalent. So when we do a substitution of a value for a variable, we have to respect alpha equivalence and only do the substitution on the free occurrences. Because this bound expression could be renamed at any time to something which is not x. And so when we define it, the, the way that we define it is we're going to say, okay, well, when you substitute e for z into a variable, then we're going to, we're going to define the substitution to be e if, the two, uh, if z is equal to x, and we're going to leave the variable alone if, uh, if, uh, if uh, it's different from, different from z. And so when we're defining e for z into a function expression, we actually end up with two cases. We'll say, we will uh, we will substitute well we'll substitute e for z into into e one if x is not in if x is uh, not equal to z and x does not occur in the free variables of e and so what this means is that uh, we we may have to rename this formal parameter as we do substitution. So if x occurs inside of e, then uh, then we have to be we have to be careful. So here's an example. So if we're if we're if we're substituting the expression 2 plus x um, for the variable z and we're substituting it into the function um, fn x goes to x plus Z. If we, <coughs> if we, we can, we if we try to if we try to do the substitution naively, what will happen? So, what we'll end up with is f n x goes to two plus x. Uh, Oh, x plus 2 plus x. 
And so now, in this expression right here, x is free. And if we substitute without renaming, the x here is bound. And so we've changed the binding status of this variable from, uh, from free here to bound here. And that's, that's, going to, that's going to give the wrong answer. So what, we, what, you, do, what you actually want to do is you want to say, all right, uh, you want to, re you want to re alpha rename as you go along so that the binding occurrence here never, never uh, the binding variable never mentions any of the variables that occur free inside of the expression you're substituting. And so now what you'll get is fny goes to y plus 2 plus x. And so now if you compare it to the wrong one, you can see that these two functions are totally different. So here, the, this x is free, and in this one, this one is bound. So you have to, you have to rename, uh, rename the, the, uh, the, the binders so that they don't collide with any of the free variables of the term that you're substituting. And so here we, we get that, that same example. So if we substitute y plus 2 into x plus y, it's, uh, it's exactly the same thing that I, that I typed a moment ago. So here you can see the renaming. And so one, one, uh, one, one more bit of notation that we'll use when we, uh, when we define how function semantics work is uh, um, substitutions which are uh, a, a map from uh, from variables to expressions. So um, we just defined how to substitute an expression for a single variable, and this thing can be lifted to a parallel or nary substitution, where we write e1 for x1 to ek to xk. And so um, uh, the convention in programming language semantics is you write substitutions with this slash rather than this mapping notation. And you'll see the definition for this in the notes. And starting in the next lecture, we're going to see how functions actually behave, like how we can use substitution to define the runtime behavior and typing of functions. Thank you.